when I, I was first appointed to this or suggested that I take this job, one of the things you have to do is have a, uh, an audience or an uh, interview with the President of the United States, uh, something that doesn't come often. And I knew just about everybody knows uh, George Bush's abhorrence of cell phones. I certainly knew it. So I go in on my uh, day of the interview, and I'm there with uh, uh, the President and his chief of staff. And in the middle of the whole thing, my cell phone goes off. <laughs> I kid thee not. And I said to myself, I'm dead. That's it. <laughs> it's over. Uh, well, it wasn't. And uh, it didn't, uh, luckily, uh, hold me up. I did find out it was my wife calling me, which wasn't. <laughs> but uh, and whenever you hear, <laughs> whenever, whenever you give that admonition about turning off the cell phones, it, uh, it brings that experience to mind. Now, I left about eight years ago to take over this position, when I, and prior, uh, prior to that, I was the uh, U.S. attorney up here in San Francisco. And I'd have occasion to come down here periodically and talk to the law school. And when I left eight years ago, uh, Stanford was one of the most prestigious, premier educational institutions in the United States. I come back to find that it is nothing more than a typical football factory, <laughs> given... <laughs> Yeah, I thought you'd be <laughs> In any event, uh, what I'd like to do, I, I'm happy you call it a conversation. What I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about uh, uh, where we've been in the last six or seven years uh, and uh, where we are today and where we're going in terms of our priorities. And then talk a little bit about uh, lessons I've learned, mistakes I've made in terms of uh, trying to uh, bring the Bureau through uh, this period. In the end, uh, talk a little bit about what uh, Mike said in terms of the legal environment in which we find ourselves and the extraordinary importance of the dialogue with regard to the balancing of national security against uh, privacy, uh, civil liberties, uh, and the like. Let me start off, uh, if I could, with um, a little bit of background. The Bureau, uh, Mike has told you a little bit about it. We've got about 32,000 people now. Uh, of those 32,000, approximately 13,000 are agents. Uh, we are dispersed. We have 56 field offices around the country, large offices, and we have uh, 400 resident agencies, which are satellite offices. So we pretty much cover the United States. We have overseas now 61 legal attache offices, have grown uh, substantially over the last few years. Uh, and as Mike pointed out, we have a budget and now about $7.5 billion. So it's a rather large organization and we've grown rather substantially over the last few years, basically in response to what happened on September 11th. And for us, uh, September 11th was a watershed. Uh, it was a watershed um, because it drove us to change rather dramatically our focus. It uh, required us to change the metrics, and it, it has done so as a result of uh, what happened on September 11th. Prior, prior to September 11th, uh, yes, we uh, had a number of uh, television shows. Uh, we have a, an exalted history. We actually had our 100th anniversary uh, last year. Uh, but prior to September 11th, the American public expected uh, us to go out and investigate crimes after they occurred, including terrorist attacks. Uh, before September 11th, uh, you had the 1993 bombings of the Twin Towers in New York. You had the 1995 Oklahoma City bombings, uh, McVeigh. Uh, several hundred people lost their lives in that. East African bombings, the Kobar the Tower bombings in Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, bombing of the coal off uh, Yemen. And in every one of these instances, the American public would look at us and the FBI would go out, as we have traditionally done, to do the investigation, identify those responsible, and bring them to justice. That changed on September 11th. And the metric was no longer the FBI going out and investigating and bringing the persons to justice. It was, why did the FBI let this happen? I tend to think, and reflecting back upon it, that part of it may well be that the 19 hijackers immediately responsible for what happened on September 11th killed themselves in the events of that day. And so the focus was not on who was responsible so much, because fairly quickly afterwards we determined that the 19 hijackers that killed themselves were immediately responsible. But why did the CIA, why did the FBI, why did uh, NSA, why did our intelligence and law enforcement agencies let this, let this happen? And so the metric came from a change from who have you arrested, who have you indicted, who have you convicted to, 
how'd you let this happen? And the one metric is not let it happen again. And for us, for us that was a dramatic, uh, a dramatic change and a catalyst for change in the Bureau. And uh, since then, uh, I would say that we've gone through maybe three phases of, of uh, a development as a result of what happened on uh, September 11th. The first one I would call triage, uh, immediately, uh, the immediate response. The second, I would say laying the foundation of a domestic intelligence agency. And the third, that I'll talk about briefly, is maturation, maturation of the intelligence capacity of the Bureau. Let me start with triage. In the immediate aftermath of September 11th, we had to do a number of things. First of all was prioritize. And prioritiz prioritization means actually prioritizing. That means determining your priorities and setting them as a priorities and making certain the personnel, the money, the support goes to those particular uh, priorities. Uh, and so the first thing we did is prioritize. Counterterrorism was number one. Counterintelligence, protecting our secrets was number two. And number three on the national security side was cyber. On the criminal side, um, we had been, as, as Mike pointed out, we have over 200 violations, probably far more than that, that we're responsible for. We had to prioritize on the criminal side. So it was, first of all, public corruption. And secondly, civil rights. And you may ask, why do you prioritize those two? And the answer, the quick answer is, because if we do not do it, nobody else does. You cannot count on another agency to investigate the civil rights abuses or uh, the public corruption that you see in federal, state, uh, local uh, governments. A third area on the criminal side was international, transnational organized crime because we investigate across state borders, across national and international borders, and something that state and local law, law enforcement cannot do. At the same time, back in uh, 2001, 2002, white collar crime was big. If you recall, we had Enron, we had HealthSouth, we had WorldCom, we had Quest, any number of very large frauds perpetrated by large corporations in which investors lost millions and indeed billions uh, of dollars. So the fourth on the criminal side was white collar crime, and the fifth was violent crime, mainly because anybody is familiar with the devastation of violent crime on our cities knows that whatever agency you're in and you can contribute to reduction of that violent crime, you should. So the first thing for us to do was prioritize putting counterterrorism uh, number one. We shifted 2,000 agents from the criminal programs over to counterterrorism. 1,500 of those agents were doing drug cases. The other 500 were doing uh, smaller white collar uh, criminal cases. Uh, but we needed those resources to investigate what happened on September 11th and to investigate and follow up on the series of threats that we had after September 11th that seemed immediate and uh, imminent. The other part was, at, at that time, uh, building up what we call joint terrorism task forces, uh, where we had 35 of them before uh, September 11th. We now have 106. And they are, we are led by the FBI, but contributors are state and local law enforcement, other federal agencies, so that we leverage our ability to address terrorism in each one of our communities, not just with the FBI, not just with federal resources, but also pulling in the sheriffs and the sheriff's deputies and uh, police officers and the others who are so essential to protecting us against the next uh, terrorist attack. As I said, we built up our legal attache offices overseas in places that we had not been before, places like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, places uh, in the Middle East uh, where terrorism was uh, hot. Uh, and so uh, we build up uh, the, uh, the investigative capabilities on the counterterrorism side. And one other factor that came into play then that we recognized we had to change, and that it was the presumption prior to September 11th that you did not disclose anything about your investigations to anybody else. And had to reverse that presumption so that whatever information we discovered in the United States relating to terrorism, could be integrated with that intelligence developed by the CIA, NSA, DIA, any of the intelligence communities overseas so that we had the full picture and not just part of the picture. That is what I would call triage, the first six months of the first year. At the same time, we understood there was an a, a ongoing debate uh, in the United States as to whether the FBI should be split. Take the criminal programs, leave it with the FBI, take counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and intelligence and have a, domestic, a separate domestic intelligence agency. Thought it would be uh, probably one of the worst ideas for the United States 
in, in uh, being effective in addressing uh, terrorism. But uh, the fact of the matter is we had to augment our capabilities with building up an, a domestic intelligence capability. We, over the years, uh, to the extent that we have a history of capability, it has been in what I would call collection using the intelligence uh, community uh, jargon. Uh, and that is, uh, we have been particularly good in the four areas, basically four areas of collection. The first area is sources, witnesses, um, uh, interviews, uh, what the, the intelligence community calls human. We've been particularly good also at conducting wires, uh, whether it be criminal wires under what's called Title III, or national security wires under the, uh, uh, pursuant to an order of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Whenever we do a wire, uh, we do it with the approval, and by a wire I mean an interception of substantive conversations. We do it with the approval of a court, whether it be an art, a, uh, a, uh, a regular uh, Article III court or uh, the, the FISA court. Uh, the third area, which is tremendously important collection, is surveillance. Uh, not uh, necessarily the electronic surveillance, but the physical surveillance, trailing people around, aerial surveillance. And the fourth area in which we've been particularly good in the past is forensics, DNA, fingerprints, uh, explosives, and the like. We're good at that, have been good at that for most of our hundred years, but what we lacked was an intelligence capability. And so the next part was putting in place the foundation for an intelligence agency, and that meant hiring approximately a thousand uh, 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 analysts, uh, building up at, back at headquarters what we call the uh, intelligence directorate, each of our 56 field offices field intelligence groups, and then putting in place the databases, the search engines that you need to put the various, pull the various dots together so that it paints a picture of the threat that you're trying to, uh, try to, uh, trying to uh, intercept. So we put that into place for uh, the next couple, two or three years, and then we got to a place which uh, I call uh, uh, maturation. And it's something that I had missed, uh, and uh, the essence of actually a domestic intelligence agency that I had missed at the outset. And that is uh, two, two areas we call. One is mindset, and the other is skill set. In terms of mindset, we in the Bureau um, have been reactive most of our history. And that as event happens, we go in and investigate afterwards. And uh, if you asked any of us five, six, eight, ten years ago about the threat from organized crime or the threat from Hezbollah or Hamas or Al-Qaeda or what have you, we would turn to the number of cases we had open on those particular threats to define the threat. It was always reactive. It was what we knew. What is so much more important, though, if you were going to anticipate attacks, is understanding what you do not know, the gaps. It's one thing to know and, and be on top of something. It's another thing to identify a gap of your knowledge, identify a threat, identify a gap, and then collect to fill that gap. And so for us, it was if you want to anticipate an attack, you have to look at it differently than we had traditionally in the law enforcement mode. And that's identifying the gaps in our knowledge in any particular threat. It can be gangs, it can be MS-13, 18th Street Gang, Taliban Gang over here in uh, East Palo Alto. Understanding who the leaders are, understanding the gaps in our knowledge is as important as anything else if we are to intercept and address that particular uh, threat. So mindset was a piece of it. And the other piece of it was building up the expertise. And by expertise, I'd always thought just an analyst is an analyst and an analyst. But the fact of the matter, there are degrees of expertise when you develop a competent domestic intelligence service that you have to build to. You have to have reports officers that know, know how to disseminate the information throughout the intelligence community. You need domain managers to understand the domain. A domain for our office here is Northern California. And what are the threats here? Uh, Nuestra Familia, uh, Mexican Mafia, Serenos, Nordenos, uh, white collar crime, public corruption across the board. Understanding the domain and the gaps in your knowledge uh, was part of that, and the domain manager handles that, requirements manager. Um, uh, all these skill sets we had to start building, and that's part of the process that I describe now as matur maturation. And so if you look at uh, us at this point, we have grown, we have laid the foundation of the domestic uh, intelligence capability that we need, uh, but at the same time, uh, we have uh, allocated our resources due and continued the investigations that we have uh, traditionally uh, undertaken. If you, uh, 
if you look at, uh, as I indicated, we had to change our priorities uh, back early in uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2002, uh, right after September 11th. If you look at those priorities today and through the, the prism of what is happening throughout the United States today, you'll see that those priorities we established back then are pretty much uh, are and should be the priorities of today. Uh, with the capabilities we have now, we're addressing uh, mortgage fraud. In terms of white collar crime, we have 2,700, approximately 2,700 cases around the country. Uh, we have 20, approximately 2,500 of health care uh, fraud cases around the country. In addition to mortgage fraud, we have any number of corporate fraud cases, security fraud cases that we're addressing given the economic turntown of uh, the last a couple of years. Counterterrorism, you can understand, is still our number one priority, particularly if you've read the newspapers in the last month, six weeks, two, two months. Uh, the first case we had was out of Charlotte, an individual by the name of Boyd, I arrested approximately two months ago with a number of other people. In the last two to three weeks, we've had a case out of Dallas, Texas, an individual uh, sought to blow up a bank building. Another individual in Springfield, Illinois, who uh, sought to build up, blow up a federal building. And then we had the case in Denver and New York, an individual uh, who was out, uh, according to the papers, uh, uh, looking for the ingredients to, to uh, put together uh, an uh, explosive device using uh, a TATP. And so there have been a series of cases in the last uh, um, six weeks or two months that would indicate that we can't take our eye off the ball when it comes to, when it comes to terrorism. A brief aside on, on, on terrorism. Uh, the cases we have here, uh, persons were radicalized uh, in a variety of ways, but if you look at what we face overseas at this point or domestically, you can see that we still face a substantial uh, al-Qaeda presence in the western part of Pakistan, eastern Afghanistan, uh, it was called Waziristan, the federally administered tribal areas, with a, an intent to uh, develop uh, westerners who can insert themselves into western societies and undertake uh, attacks. You have Al-Qaeda that has expanded in the last couple of years to places like uh, Somalia, uh, Yemen, uh, North Africa, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb it's called, which is still a substantial threat for us uh, to address. You have those here who travel over to uh, be uh, trained, and then you have others here in the United States who have been radicalized here, whether it be by associates or mentors or indeed uh, the internet. Counterterrorism, white collar crime, and lastly, I'll spend a moment on violent crime. Our statistics that we push out uh, every six months have shown over the last several years that violent, violent crime is down. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if you look at uh, where we are today and what we can anticipate in the future, uh, you will see that uh, we've locked up a number of people in the 90s. And many of them are uh, going to get out. And that's even without the possible 40,000 that uh, are going to be released in California, given the the budget crisis. And these, uh, unfortunately, often are individuals who have no skills other than the skills they picked up in prison, and they're not the skills that are marketable uh, in, the, uh, in the outside. And acquaintances they've met in the inside, uh, that will be acquaintances on the outside. And they're coming out to an economy where even if you have a skill set, it is very difficult to find a job. So I have very few illusions that uh, the violent crime that we've seen is going to continue on its downward pace. Unfortunately, I think it will probably, uh, probably begin uh, to rise. And in, that, in, in addressing that, we go back to what is absolutely essential uh, to our capability, whether it be counterterrorism or just about any threat, and that is task forces and working together with state and, state and local uh, law enforcement. So if you look at uh, uh, where we've been, uh, uh, September 11th was uh, a transforming event for us. Uh, we build up uh, in the triage, we've moved persons from the criminal side of the house to the uh, national security side of the house. Uh, but with the threats we see today, particularly the domestic threats uh, in white collar arena, in the, the gang arena, uh, we'll be building up our resources over on the, on the criminal side. And the last note on that, um, public corruption, I said, was our number one priority then, number one priority now, because if we don't do it, uh, nobody else will. Uh, occasionally, they get the headlines, uh, Jefferson, Congressman Jefferson being one, Blagojevich out of Illinois being another, and uh, a number of you may have read uh, about the arrest of 40 uh, separate individuals in uh, New Jersey uh, several months ago. 
And so hey, that's something you cannot take your eye off of. And right now we have a conjunction of events in which the federal government is pushing out a great uh, amount of money um, in the TARP program, the stimulus program, and the like through federal, state, and local <laughs> entities which, given the amounts that they have, are uh, to a certain extent invitation to fraud and corruption. And so in addition to what we are doing with the mortgage fraud crisis, uh, what we're doing in the securities fraud, corporate fraud uh, arena, uh, we have the prospect of a lot of work down the road uh, with the monies uh, flowing from the federal government uh, through uh, these various uh, state and local entities. Um, if you ask for the future in terms of our programs, if you ask for what do we look, uh, what's a bureau look like 5, 10, 20 uh, years down the road, which we try to do, there are a combination of factors that contributed to the belief that we will continue to grow as a national, but more particularly an international law enforcement slash national security slash intelligence agency. If you read the, the books by Tom Friedman or read his columns uh, in the impact of globalization, he talks about globalization when it comes to merchandise or manufacturing or financing and the like. What he has not yet addressed is globalization when it comes to crime, globalization when it comes to terrorism, and the uh, ability of terrorists and criminals uh, to jump across borders uh, with ease uh, to commit uh, crimes, whether it be terrorism or white collar, uh, narcotics trafficking, trafficking persons. And in the future, uh, because of globalization, and we're not so insulated as we have been in the past, the oceans no longer protect us. It'll be uh, uh, in part our mission to be the bridge between state and local law enforcement and uh, our counterparts overseas, which again gets back to why we have built up uh, so many uh, legal attache offices. Uh, let me turn for a moment to talk briefly about uh, lessons learned uh, in terms of the management aspect of, uh, of uh, being with the Bureau as we've gone through this, this evolution. And there are four, four areas I'll touch on. Uh, the one thing that uh, I'd learned early on, uh, but it's always reinforced day in and day out, is the most important thing you have is your people. And I mean, people uh, in at least uh, two ways. Most important decisions I make are not on a particular uh, a subject matter, a particular investigation, or actually when I was a prosecutor, a particular prosecution. Most important decisions I would make at any point in time are the people, who I promote, who I put into particular positions. In terms of transforming an organization, the most important component generally, unless you're high tech and very high tech, is the people. And uh, the time you spend, uh, one spends too little time on that. One always should spend more time, but it's absolutely essential. The other aspect of, uh, of focusing on the people and the persons in this, uh, at this time is the necessity to, in some sense, change a culture. A culture in the Bureau of investigating after the fact and being applauded and patted on the back and described and defined in, uh, in television uh, commentary uh, a, as being glorified to a, a, an FBI that is focused on particular threats where you don't end up in the courtroom the next day, you don't end up slapping cuffs on somebody and have the satisfaction of seeing them go to trial, be convicted, and go to jail. And so agents have joined the Bureau with that in mind. I want to put people behind bars. I, as a prosecutor, I love to put, I love what I did. I uh, loved trying the case, and I was satisfied if I got a, a conviction. But changing that culture so that you understand the importance, uh, what's primarily important to the American public, no, not another uh, terrorist attack, preserving our secrets from those who would steal them, is a change that is very difficult uh, in the best of times and uh, difficult also in the worst of times. Although I will say that after September 11th, one of the side effects of September 11th was the understanding by just about everybody in the Bureau uh, that we could not let it happen again. And so if we had not had that catalyzing event, I do not believe we would have made the strides that we've made today to change the culture, to understand the priorities, and to bring uh, everybody in the Bureau, whether you're an agent or an analyst or a professional staff person, uh, behind uh, the concept that the American public expects us to stop September 11th, and we have to do it, even though 
More often than not, it will not result in cuffs being slapped on somebody and somebody going to jail. But the people and handling the people and talking about the culture and bringing the, 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 uh, uh, the wonderful people that uh, work in the Bureau uh, along to understand uh, that uh, vision uh, has been a challenge, but it has been eased by the fact that everybody after September 11th realized that we had to change. Second area, which is tremendously problematic, uh, that I had never fully understood, never expected to be problematic, and that is information technology and the integration of information technology in an organization. And what I come to find after a, a probably a, what was about $197 million mistake is that um, you have to keep your fingers on it, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But the challenge in this technological world is taking an individual who is knowledgeable in technology on the one hand and putting them together and marrying that individual with a person who knows and understands the business practices. If all you're going to do is digitize a standard business practice, that's not too bad, and that marriage is fairly easy. If, on the other hand, you want to update and modernize your business practices and use technology to do it, it is tremendously difficult. On the one hand, I have the geeks, as I call them, and they are affectionately known within the building who know the technology. On the other hand, you have agents who have been and know the business, who have been in the business for 10, 15, 20, 25 years and know the business practices, but the marriage is very, very difficult. And one of the first big mistakes uh, I made was continuing on a software package thinking it would work and only to come to find that there was not, you did not have that marriage of the information technologist and the person who understand and knew and understood and knew the business practices of the Bureau. And it is a, I think it's a huge challenge for anybody in this business who has to upgrade uh, the technology while still running the business at a, uh, at a clip. Third area is what I would call uh, a combination of um, delegation and execution. Those of you who are business students, there are uh, tons of books out there about execution and execution is important. And every one of those books, read them. They're good because execution, people can come up with ideas, but executing the ideas is the hard part. And it comes to intersect uh, somewhat with delegation. One of the uh, things I recall, I, and I, I'm a strong supporter, as you might imagine, of the Marine Corps, and the training I got in the Marine Corps, I wouldn't be here without that training, but one of the things that uh, I remember is going through officer candidate school in the Marine Corps, and you get in there and you're, I don't know, it was 10 weeks or whatever it was, and you get about third, week third or four and they start evaluating you. They evaluate you, obviously, on your fitness for it. Can you do it? They evaluate you on how you're doing on the scholastic part of it and on the exams and the like. And I did pretty well on both of those. And then they got down to another area called delegation. I said, what are you talking about delegation? Well, and I didn't do well on that. And I said, what? <laughs> why are you downgrading me on delegation? He said, because one of the most important things you will learn as a Marine Corps officer in your, in your duty, in your assignments, is the ability to delegate. And I, I say they're intertwined, delegation and execution, because indeed they are. You have to know how to delegate, and you have to know to whom to delegate, and you have to know what to delegate if you're going to get something executed. And I've made any number of mistakes uh, in uh, that regard. I, I, when I first came in this job, I read most of the books that uh, I could that would help me be a manager. Prior to that, I've been a lawyer, and there is nothing more antithetical than being a manager than being a lawyer. And, I, I, and so I got the management books, and the management books always talk about uh, the CEO or the head of an organization should be up in the balcony and not on the dance floor. Uh, you've read that, you've seen that, responsible for strategy and direction and all the rest of those good things. Well, I started to do that, do that for a period of time. One, one area I knew I could not delegate, and that was uh, terrorism. I had to brief the president every day for four years, and in briefing the president every day for four years, and then once a week afterwards, you learn you cannot delegate that. You push it through the organization and you have to be ready to respond. That was pretty easy. But the mistake I made in technology was to rely on advisors and not ask the hard questions, be up in that balcony and say, okay, and, and listen to the platitudes about how good it's going to be without asking the hard questions that inevitably, in my own mind, I, sh I knew I should have been asking. And so when it comes to being on the being in the balcony or on the dance floor, 
Yes, you have to learn when to delegate and leave it to the dance floor, but there are other areas that you have to do. You cannot delegate. They're so important that you intimately have to know the ins and outs of them. That's the third. The fourth is listening and uh, the importance of listening and finding ways to listen. Uh, in a position such as mine, everybody below you wants to tell you how good things are, and finding out how bad things are is the real, is the real uh, uh, challenge. And it's listening. Uh, one quick anecdote about listening. Uh, um, some time ago when I was, I, I moved from California, went to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, uh, and it was pretty much my first supervisory position. I was head of the criminal division in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. And over a period of time, you'll find if you manage people that there are two types of people that come into your office. Those that want to have FaceTime, they come, want to come in and talk to you. And the other people want to come in and get a decision or get something done. And after a period of time, if you're busy and you're going day in and day out, you start asking the question. As soon as a person appears in the doorway, you say, what's the issue? Is there something I have to decide or you want to talk? So over a period of time, I got in the habit of asking, what's the issue? Well, one night I come home and I come into the kitchen <laughs> and my wife <laughs> greets me at the door and we have a, a, a conversation, as you would have at night, a dialogue to which she starts talking to me about what happened to the kids at school and I'm a little bit tired and I've been asking the question all day, so I say, darling, what's the issue? <laughs> And my wife, who was gentle, kind, all of a sudden turns into a tigress. <laughs> I am your wife. I am not somebody who serves under you. Don't you ever ask me what the issue is. You sit there and you listen to me till I'm through. <laughs> it, it's the absolute truth. <laughs> and I would like to say I've learned the lesson. I'm not certain she would agree, however. Uh, but uh, apart from uh, a commentary on intramarital uh, success, I, I would tell you that it it's a lesson to learn. As somebody who is in a business of running other things, you want to solve the problems. And you don't spend enough time listening. And if I have one great failure, it is I'll sit down in a meeting, I'll hear about five minutes of it, and then I want to jump to a solution. And the fact of the matter is I, I should do more listening. And so I, that's a fourth area that uh, I've tried to learn in the last, in the last um, several, uh, several years. Uh, let me turn for a moment and finish up on the legal side of the house. Because as Mike points out, and as we knew uh, in September 11th, we would have to build up a domestic intelligence capability. Uh, and we'd have to uh, address um, our mission in a far different way. When you're within the court system, when you're doing criminal cases, the monitor is the court system itself. You don't get a search warrant without going to a magistrate and uh, laying out the probable cause. Um, uh, you have a defense counsel, it's always questioning uh, what happened, and so there is an automatic monitor. When you are developing intelligence, on the other hand, there is no court system monitor to the extent that you have it in the criminal justice system. And there is a balance that has to be made day in and day out between national security and civil liberties. I am comfortable with that balance how, as to how we have addressed it over the, uh, the number of, of years. It is part of our history. It is part of our legacy. I'm going to in a moment read a, an excerpt from uh, what we admonish our, our special agents. But if you look back at the... Uh, uh, what has happened in terms of that balance over the last several years. We've had the Patriot Act uh, that people are, are, some people are supportive of, some uh, question. But the fact of the matter is the Patriot Act dropped the walls between uh, the intelligence community on the one hand and the law enforcement community on the other. Before the Patriot Act, one half of the FBI could not talk to the other half of the FBI because one half of the FBI was in the criminal arena, the other half was in the intelligence arena. Uh, the information that had gathered by the CIA or NSA overseas could not be shared with the FBI, nor could the FBI share with those entities the information that had been developed here. And so inevitably, in each of those agencies, you had only a partial picture of what was happening. And so the Patriot Act, and it's up for uh, the revisions that they're talking about, uh, day in and day out now, and, but I am very comfortable and supportive and believe that that is absolutely essential to assuring uh, the safety of the country without 
unduly uh, uh, burdening uh, civil liberties or privacy. Same thing with the debate on the FISA Court, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, what is required in order for us to, and by us I mean ourselves and the intelligence community to get a order from the FISA Court to intercept conversations. It absolutely had to be updated, probably will have to be updated uh, every other year because of the developing uh, technology, peer-to-peer, -peer, Skype, encryption, all of these things that made it increasingly difficult for us uh, to do our job if we are to prevent another terrorist attack. And so if you look at uh, the legislation that has been passed, if you look at uh, what we have done in the Bureau since September 11th, I'm comfortable that we have done what we should uh, within the confines of the Constitution, uh, the statutes, and uh, the Attorney General guidelines. Let me finish with reading you the admonition that we give new agents, or at least an excerpt of the admonition that we give new agents as they uh, come out and get their, uh, their badges. For the past 100 years, the FBI has stood for some of the best of America. We have disrupted terrorist cells. We have rescued hostages from kidnappers. We have broken the backs of organized criminal groups. And we have put violent criminals and drug dealers behind bars. And we have done this by adhering to our motto of fidelity, bravery, and integrity. And by respecting the authority given to us under the Constitution. Today, we are building on that legacy as we focus on our top priority, preventing another terrorist attack in the United States. And it is indeed a time of change in the Bureau, but our values never change. As always, we will protect the security of our nation while upholding the civil rights guaranteed by the Constitution to every citizen. It is not enough to prevent foreign countries from stealing our secrets. We must prevent that happening while still upholding the rule of law. It is not enough to stop the terrorists. We must stop him while maintaining civil liberties. It is not enough to catch the criminal. We must catch him while respecting his civil rights. The rule of law, civil liberties, civil rights, these are not our burdens. They are what make us better, and they are what have made us better for the past 100 years. You, each of you, new agents, are charged with upholding this legacy. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. You know what this is like? I'll tell you what this is like. I go out and visit my offices. Today I was up in Seattle visiting my office. And at the end I always say, you got any questions or things I ought to know? And there is dead silence. <laughs> the only difference being that there's dead silence when I ask my people that because they expect if they ask a question I don't like, they'll be transferred to Yemen or someplace. <laughs> but I can't transfer. I don't control you, so. <laughs> And to, let me go right over here. Yes, sir. Wait. I'm sorry. I was looking for the person with yeah. the microphone. Okay, sorry. thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Sindridge. And what I wanted to ask you is uh, with regards to uh, Vladimir Putin, is he, I understand he may be building a factory in Venezuela for a. Uh, AK, to build AK-47, is this something that we don't know about or should know about? Uh, it's a, uh, the question was uh, Vladimir Putin uh, building a factory in Venezuela. Uh, we stay away from uh, uh, that. That's a little bit too precise for an answer. <laughs> you, know, you know what you learn in this business is the duck questions. <laughs> and something like that, even if I did know the answer, I'm not certain in this, in this arena I could, I could discuss it. Yes, sir, over here, the yellow. Okay. And I think... Hello. Why have we not had another terrorist the question is, in my opinion, why have we not had another terrorist incident? And I attribute it to a number of factors. Um, the first factor is the, uh, the uh, going into Afghanistan in the immediate wake of September 11th and removing the sanctuary for Al Qaeda. And that was instrumental. Prior to that, uh, training, uh, recruiting training, uh, the uh, September 11 plot was hatched and organized and run from the sanctuary of Afghanistan, and removing that sanctuary was uh, the first uh, order of business, and appropriately so. 
Uh, secondly, the work that the, principally the CIA has done overseas in taking off the leadership of Al-Qaeda. If you look at somebody like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was responsible for September 11th, he was spent a couple of years in, in uh, North Carolina at college. He understood the United States, computer literate, uh, charismatic, a tremendous organizer, uh, a, a confidant of bin Laden. You take somebody like that off the playing field, and it is very, very difficult to replace them. And over a series of years, uh, the CIA has taken off the major leadership uh, of Al Qaeda. And regardless of how you feel about the various aspects of it, it has had a, a substantial effect on uh, our ability to, uh, to prevent another terrorist attack. And the third area I would say is somewhat what I've described, is the vigilance within this country, the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, the ability to work with the rest of the intelligence community to pick up a snippet of information that would indicate that a a, uh, a terrorist plot is afoot and to disrupt it before it comes to, uh, to fruition. Uh, right here in the middle, lady in blue. Uh, the question was, uh, we have the 56 field offices, and they're run by a special agent in charge. And you allude to the autonomy they have. They, have, they probably think they have more autonomy than <laughs> I, I can tell you they wish they had more autonomy than they have. Uh, but how do we uh, transform? P part of it is developing leadership over a period of time, and leadership that understands the mission and is going to subscribe to that mission. It takes a while to replace and build it up. The other thing we do, which is a, a uh, we learned from the New York Police Department, uh, uh, Bill Bratton, who used to, uh, just took over, or no, took over several years ago, uh, Los Angeles Police Department, established, been established it in New York, which is called Comstat, which means pulling in statistics relating to crime by precinct. And every week having a meeting with the precinct commanders where you, you, you confront them with the statistics and confront them with uh, asking them what are they doing to drive down those statistics. We've adopted that. Uh, we call it SPS sessions. Don't, I don't know what it stands for, but uh, every, every other week I have four offices uh, on the video conference. And I'll spend uh, two hours, half hour each, going through what the threat is in each of those offices and uh, what they're doing to address the threat, to fill the gaps. Where are your sources? Where are you lacking source coverage? How many Title Threes do you have? What do you need in terms of electronic surveillance? Uh, 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 what else do you need in support? And what are you doing about it? How are you prioritizing? And so it is a give and take. Um, it gives me an opportunity to learn more about the office. Uh, it puts them through uh, a rigorous exercise in preparing for that, uh, but dri also drives the organization. It's one of the, the initiatives I think has been partic particularly helpful during this period of matura matura maturization. Uh, let me go right here, sir. I, uh, InfraGuard is a program, I, we've got uh, I think 70,000 or something in, in InfraGuard now is a program we have outreach to private industry where we have a network with uh, uh, private industry focused principally but not all, totally on uh, the cyber arena. And it is uh, exceptionally helpful uh, for us to learn what is happening in various companies when it comes to the cyber, uh, cyber arena, particularly cyber warfare. Uh, and cyber intrusions and the like, and also is a mechanism that uh, we utilize to, um, uh, to pass on information to those who are a member of the, cyber, uh, the uh, InfraGuard program. So I give it high marks, and it's a program that we're continuing to expand. One of the issues I did not focus on in this dialogue is the impact of uh, cyber uh, crime on what we do across the board. And if you look at the future of the Bureau, one of the, the expanding areas for us is going to be uh, addressing cyber. If cyber attacks, uh, uh, denial of service attacks, uh, worms, viruses, uh, uh, any number of phishing schemes. Uh, we just yesterday took down a, uh, a group of Egyptians and individuals in the United States made over, I think, 70 arrests at this point where we had a phishing scheme that was operated uh, in Egypt and the United States with a number of victims here, but also a number of victims uh, overseas. And that is going to be an expanding area 
of uh, interest for us. Uh, yes, sir, in the, in the blue shirt, in the turquoise <laughs> shirt. Uh, I have a couple of related questions. Uh, a child used to wield a lot of power, and the, quote, the wise words of you know, Spider-Man, <laughs> with power comes responsibility. How does FBI, or what are some of the checks and balances, both internal to FBI, to prevent the abuse of power within FBI? Yeah. And, and related to that, you know, what happens you know, when there is corruption, let's say, within FBI? Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, we have a lot of power uh, in our responsibilities uh, to affect persons' lives. And there's not a one of us does not understand that. What do we do to prevent that abuse? Let me mention uh, two. Uh, first of all, uh, the Attorney General guidelines. Uh, we operate within attorney, or attorney General guidelines, applicable statutes in the Constitution. And basically, basically that means we get an allegation. We can do uh, minimal investigation to determine whether we should do further investigation. Uh, and so there are levels of predication that we have to meet before we, we institute or utilize additional investigative tools. Uh, the most intrusive investigative uh, tools, uh, listening to conversations uh, and the like, we can only do with a, a, the, the approval of a court showing appropriate probable cause. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is a debate I've had with myself uh, since, to a certain extent since I started. Uh, to be an agent in the FBI, you have to be 23 years of old. You have to have three years uh, of work experience uh, and, uh, you know, a, a, a sparkling background and all the rest of that. But what we, uh, the average age of our graduating class of new agents is 30. And almost all have had another career. You know, when I came in, uh, one of the things that was problematic and still to a certain extent is problematic is we would, uh, we do very little recruiting on campuses because we want the three years experience. And you have to be 23. And so we're missing uh, a lot of people. Uh, but on the other hand, the argument is made, and this is the one that I, at this, am persuaded about now, is going to your point. We have a tremendous amount of power. We give an agent a badge and a gun and the ability to adversely impact a person's life. The most important thing for our people then are judgment, maturity, and an understanding of the power uh, that we entrust to them. So I have gone back and forth, and we're doing much more recruiting on college campuses that we've done before, but I still think, given what you point out, the power that we have, that maturity and judgment are absolutely essential in exercising uh, that power. Uh, yes, sir, right. Well, actually, let me take somebody in back. I'm the blue sweater. <laughs> yep, right under the camera. Oh, you can turn uh, around, you'll be on camera. Oh, no, the guy in front of you. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and that's only because he had a jacket on, not to worry. <laughs> so, Go ahead. Um, you very nice describe um, how you went from a, a reactive force to a proactive force. And you also said you have these 32,000 people. So f going from reactive to proactive, you have probably to increase your speed a lot and especially your speed of internal learning. Um, can you maybe give us an insight with these two groups you said? You have the geeks and you have the agents. Um, what mechanisms you have internally to learn quickly and be ahead of things than just afterwards looking yeah. what happened? Well, let me, let me say we have a number of agents that are geeks also <laughs> because we have, what I was talking about is those people that are instituting, putting together the networks, the hardware, the software in order for you to exchange the information. I mean, we have a career path now. We bring in people who have the experience in the cyber arena and teach them how to be agents and do the investigative work. Uh, and so we have a series of career paths where we build, are, are building in, are bringing in not only the maturity and the judgment, but a particular degree of expertise that we need. I'll tell you, with weapons of mass destruction now, we want, uh, we want chemists, we want biologists. We had the, the uh, cy not the cyber, but the anthrax attacks of 2002. And consequently, we bring in persons with that, that uh, baseline expertise, which is in part uh, contributes to the fact that the average age of our um, graduating class is 30. And within those particular components, we have, I would say, a fairly good uh, educational and training uh, capability uh, so that we stay ahead, whether it be cyber or counterterrorism, counterintelligence, so we stay ahead of our, our adversaries. One of the, uh, the areas that we have not done as good a job on as I would like, and that is developing leadership and leaders. 
Uh, when you talk about judgment and maturity, you also want leadership. You want the, uh, you need different persons that come in. They need differing experiences, different uh, periods in their career. The military does a very good job. We do an okay job of it, but we're putting substantial emphasis on uh, building and maturing uh, leadership uh, throughout the Bureau for the next six months or the next year. It, and that, in my mind, is as important as anything else we do. Uh, where we go? How about the uh, gentleman in the blue? Uh, right, no, with, uh, you both got glasses. <laughs> yes, sir, you. Yeah, we went like that. <laughs> you referred to the separations between the FBI and the CIA. A separation that used to be noted, particularly, was the FBI, the FBI was domestic, CIA was overseas. Yeah. With the expansion of FBI presence, overseas, that line must be pretty blurred at times. And then as a follow-up, what about liaison with foreign intelligence organizations? Well, it's actually one of the same question. The, uh, uh, you'll find that uh, you, I don't know whether you're in the agency, but you've probably spent time overseas and have seen the back and forth between the Bureau and the, and the agency prior to September 11th. Now we're embedded with the agency. The agency's embedded with us. The number two person in my national security division is an agency person. Uh, and what you find overseas is you have law enforcement. Just about every country has intelligence components and law enforcement components. Law enforcement components are always leery of the intelligence components. Intelligence components are somewhat leery of the law enforcement. And so we are uh, very good partners now overseas. And understanding that information has to be shared between us, and we have to develop information from the law enforcement components as well as the as the, uh, the intelligence components. If you look at the, the UK, you have MI5, MI6. MI5, the domestic intelligence, MI6, uh, the CIA, and then you have the Met, Scotland Yard, for instance. And we maintain relationships with all three of them, as does the CIA, and we uh, share between us understanding that we cannot let information drop between the cracks. One more question, right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that gets into, I'm going to give somebody another question because I can't get into, uh, <laughs> we always, let me just say, whenever we do a debriefing uh, or a, a backward look, we learn something. So you can assume that we learn something. One more. And the lady in back, perhaps. How does the FBI interact with the economy? What's happening with the economy, the people, the behaviors, the systems, the Everything that goes wrong with it, and how does FBI interact and impact it, and how does the economy impact it? Well, let me, uh, people ask what contributed to uh, uh, the collapse of the economy two or three years ago. Some people are wont to say it was fraud when you see all the mortgage fraud cases we have, but I think most independent observers would say it's a number of factors. Uh, the, the bailing out of the housing market, uh, a number of factors contributed to it, but with that sliver, of, uh, of persons and, uh, who have committed fraud and contributed to that. Uh, we have ongoing investigations and we're locking them up day in and day out. And uh, that'll continue to be our role. Those who committed fraud, they will get the cuffs slapped on them, they will go to jail, and they will serve time. And with that, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.